Good afternoon, everybody, friends, colleagues, alumni, and welcome to the first of our 2020 Sci-Fi series, and indeed the first of the Sci-Fi series to be delivered digitally. My name's Emma Johnston. I am a professor of marine ecology and ecotoxicology and the proud Dean of Science at UNSW. I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar on pandemic parenting, building resilience in uncertain times. Now, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we are all meeting. I personally am on Gadigal land. Uh, our presenters are also on Kuringai and Vedigal land. We'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and pay our respect to all of those traditional peoples, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining us today. So for those of you who are new to the Sci-Fi series, it's an opportunity for UNSW Science to highlight some of the talent and expertise we have in the faculty. We pick particular themes and we look not only at what's happening now, but also the latest research and how things might change into the future particularly important in such dynamic times. And normally I would have the privilege of having welcomed you personally uh, into the room and be hosting you. But of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we, uh, we work, we play, we live, and how we host events like this. So I'm thrilled to be able to pivot the event towards a digital one. I am actually uh, having some notes here. So if you see me looking down, I've got some notes to guide me through this event but we want it to be an interactive one as well. So I have some, some great questions that have come from participants already, and I'll be using those to guide some questions with our speakers, but we will also have an opportunity for you to post your own questions during the event. Uh, and that posting will be moderated and I'll see those questions come up and ask our panelists. Our conversation today is being recorded and that recording will be distributed uh, after the event. So um, do be aware of that. So COVID-19, well, the response has changed the way we do everything, but one of the key anxieties and considerations for many of us has been how to parent, how to parent well during a pandemic. Uh, there's no clear rule book, but there's lots of expertise that we can build on and that we can learn from, particularly from the School of Psychology at UNSW where our panelists uh, come from. So let me introduce you today to Dr. Georgie Fleming, who's a child psychologist and a research fellow at the UNSW Parent Child Research Clinic. She's a proud UNSW alumni as well, uh, having completed a combined PhD and Master of Psychology in 2019. Her doctoral research focused on evaluating the outcomes of parent-child interaction therapy delivered via video teleconferencing. So very sci-fi for most of us. Um, and Georgie's passionate about understanding moderators and mechanisms of treatment related change. And she strongly advocates for the use of scientific knowledge to inform clinical assessments and treatment and vice versa. Well, Georgie. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, great. And we also have Dr. Stephen Moist who is currently an associate professor in the School of Psychology at UNSW, which is the number one school for psychology in Australia, by the way. And don't let anyone else tell you anything different. Uh, so Stephen has joined us originally from the United States, where he did his PhD at Harvard, a postdoctoral fellow at Vanderbilt University and at Yale University. And Stephen's research is grounded in cognitive psychology. So he's very strong links to social psychology, clinical psychology and neuroscience. And he specialises in relationships between motivation, emotion and attention control. So really important in this era of, of parenting the pandemic. Both Georgie and Stephen have contributed many papers and publications in their areas of expertise, but we're really fortunate that they've also pulled together some material that's relevant to parenting during the pandemic and we'll be posting that material that evidence-based set of resources for you on the chat area so that you can get that during this event. Okay, so let's go to, to the beginning of it all when the anxiety was just building. The realisation that a global pandemic uh, was happening had, had just taken place. Nobody knew what was happening and then all of a sudden lockdown. All of a sudden we had 
have all of the children at home all of the time. Um, what happened during that period was this really intense build-up of anxiety, um, a lot of fear, a lot of rapid behavioural change and a lot of unknown. How do we as parents deal with that really heightened level of anxiety in our children? Anyone want to take the first question? I'm having a, I'm having a throw to that one first. So please, Steve, uh, interrupt or, or jump in there if you have thoughts. Um, but I think that the first thing to note is that not only are we having to manage this uh, rapid escalation of anxiety in our kids, it's doing it at the same time as we're also experiencing rapid anxiety. So this global event was sort of unlike a lot of things that anybody had ever experienced before because it affected everybody. So I think managing your kids' anxiety when you're also feeling anxious is a challenge in and of itself. Um, and beyond what we might do um, sort of under more typical circumstances where kids are feeling anxious. Um, and I think there was a lot of commentary and some really um, sort of useful resources about how to speak to your kids about the virus um, and how to do that in a way that both validated those fears because it's normal and understandable to feel scared at a time where everything's unknown and um, you know, there's, you might get sick and the people you love might get sick, but at the same time as managing those anxieties and reducing those fears to a level where a child's able to function. Um, so I think speaking to your kid about those sorts of anxieties in developmentally appropriate ways was one of the big tips um, that came out of how do you help a kid manage the anxiety? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I think there's a, a couple of uh, additional uh, things that we have to acknowledge, which is that uh, this is a tough time for everyone. And um, a lot of us are feeling very anxious, and that is completely normal. Um, in fact, uh, our colleague, Jill Newby, in the School of Psychology has written uh, a fair bit about this. She has a column in the Sydney Morning Herald from a few weeks ago, uh, where she actually said anxiety is not only normal, uh, but it's helpful. I mean, if you're feeling a little anxious about this, then... Um, you know, maybe you're going to be one of the people who's doing things right, who uh, is taking precautions that are necessary to keep yourself and your family healthy. Um, and, um, you know, and, and if, if you find that you can't focus on things like your work or things that you think you should be focusing on because you can't break yourself away from these anxiety-provoking thoughts, it kind of means that you're, you're reacting normally. Um, we're built to prioritize emotional information and to, you know, find, you know, to focus on things that might be reasons to be anxious. Um, another thing is that um, sometimes we feel pressure. We feel like we're not supposed to be feeling anxious. And research has actually found that those kinds of feelings that you should not be feeling depressed or anxious actually can make the anxiety and the depression worse. Uh, so you allow yourself to feel this way. It's normal, it is a, it's adaptive, and it's really you're in the same boat as, as many of the rest of us. So you, you can almost wallow in your anxiety a little bit and, and I guess name it. Does that work for children? Can, you know, do, can we teach them how to recognise the different emotions, name them, put them in the box, know that they're okay? Yeah, and I think there are ways that we can take what we know about managing anxiety with adults in sort of a clinical space and downward extend that to applying it to kids. Um, and the biggest takeaway is exactly what you just mentioned then, Emma, is, is, is making it quite external, making it quite concrete. So is it naming the worry monster? Is it giving it a name? It's like Larry the germs, and huh. that's the way that we can speak about it and make it something that's more manageable. So there are ways of uh, talking about anxiety and worry and stress and fear with children in developmentally appropriate ways. And one of the first things to do is to teach them what anxiety feels like in the body, that depending on how old they are, getting them to start being able to, speak, to distinguish between what's a feeling and what's a thought. And to know that the way that we're thinking about things often drives how we're feeling about it. 
So if I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to get sick and mummy's going to get sick and everyone's going to die and I will never be able, that makes sense that you're feeling anxious if you're thinking in that way. But if that sort of thinking, we can teach a child to become aware of when those sorts of worry thoughts are going through their head and maybe start shifting some of those worry thoughts to become more realistic, not more positive because it, the reality is this is a really scary situation, but just more realistic and more balanced. Perhaps then the anxiety that follows a thought like, it is a really scary time, but if I wash my hands, if I cough into my elbow, if I keep my distance from my friends, then I'm less likely to get the scary germs. The anxiety that follows that sort of thinking is much less intense. And so I think the role of parents here, given that not all of our kids are going to have access to therapists who can teach them these sorts of skills, the role of parents in that is to be, start becoming aware of those processes, start doing that with yourself. Oh, my own emotion regulation might sort of improve. And then to model and teach and reward kids for engaging in those sorts of processes. And, and Georgie, I mean, it sounds like based on based on what you're saying, um, you know, would it be correct to say that, you know, this intense and extreme situation that we all find ourselves in right now, it's you know, it's almost a learning opportunity. I mean, one of the uh, the milestones, one of the big things that kids have to learn when they're growing up is what an emotion is and um, how to manage their emotions, how to name their emotions and communicate their emotions, have conversations about their emotions. And, um, you know, it, it seems like the kinds of circumstances that we find ourselves in right now just really play into these developmental achievements that kids need to master and, and, and arrive at anyway. Yeah. Step, one, step one a little bit further because obviously there is different levels of understanding and the teenagers are really quite cognizant and they have lots of channels of information coming directly to them about what they would call the Rona, so they've named it. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they appear to be at an even more vulnerable stage of development where in fact the, the combination of the climate worries, the, the bushfires, um, geopolitical you know, potentially world wars. You know, everything seems to be coming at once in 2020. And I've heard a lot of teenagers talking about, you know, this is just the, the kind of the end of the world. So how do we talk differently with the teenagers versus the little ones about coping with this impending sense of doom that's coming? Yeah, Emma, I think you're right in that adolescents are a particularly vulnerable group, sort of more generally, and that's in some part explained neurologically because we do know that adolescent brain development for want of a more much more complex uh, explanation that the emotional centers of the brain like the amygdala um, and other parts of the paralympic system they're they're sort of fully going for an adolescent whereas the executive functioning parts of the brain the part of the brain that's responsible for decision making and planning and um, more rational behaviors that's still got a way to go in terms of development. So these adolescents are feeling the emotion strongly, but it's sort of under-resourced to be able to manage that emotion um, sort of appropriately in combination with being over-resourced in terms of being able to access information. Our adolescents are online and they can receive that. So I think it is a bit of a, a perfect storm for the adolescents. Um, and in terms of speaking to them about their worries, not only about the Rona, but beyond that, I think it is important to keep in mind that they they do they are adults they do have um, sort of the, there are developmental considerations but to include them as stakeholders in the discussions um, I know that there was a survey done by UNICEF I think in mid April of Australian teenagers 13 to 17 year olds and about a quarter of them surveyed said we don't feel like we are being considered as important stakeholders in this conversation. So I think empowering an adolescent um, to have an opinion of what's happening to them and what they're being told to do and not what to do um, can both validate that feeling but also provide them with a sense of self-efficacy um, that there are things that they do have control over. And so I think it is in the same way as we were talking about before, talking to them about their anxieties, it's important to validate and help them um, sort of think realistically about the state of the world, but also acknowledge that they have things to offer in 
in terms of their own lived experiences, and we need to consider that. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to just point out or, or build on something that uh, Georgie also said, uh, which was this um, one thing that when you challenge that the adolescents face that the younger kids don't necessarily face is all of this, these different sources of information. Uh, some of it is, is good information from, from uh, knowledgeable authorities and of the other information is just these, you know, panicked uh, worst case scenarios that they see on social media or just misinformation spreads like wildfire. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that might be a conversation that would be important to have with adolescents that isn't necessarily something that you have to have yet with the younger kids, which is how do you, how do you know what is a useful source of information and how do you know who to trust on this? Um, you know, that's something that um, adolescents and adults struggle with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, I've, I've heard also limiting exposure to that information can actually be useful as well. So getting teenagers to think about, have I had enough? Of the bad news, do I need to just chillax and, and look at something like a comedy, or you know, really take some time out, go for a walk? So, in terms of moderating exposure to to digital technology, we know there are a few issues there. But one of the things that the lockdown has done, and, and you know, this kind of period of turning inwards, is it's meant that people are together a lot more than they ever were for really relentless periods of time. Right. So uh, I read a really funny quote from someone who was saying, well. You know, I married my husband for breakfast and dinner, but not lunch. Um, and, you know, and so this, this is intensity of exposure with, with your children, but also with your partners. How do people keep their relationships strong during that period, that overexposure almost? Anyone got any tips? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for everyone. And, um, you know, there, there's some advice that has come been put forth by the uh, psychological community, actually, uh, acknowledging just that this isn't something that all of us sign on for, this constantly being together. And um, part of it is just to, uh, to know in advance that you're going to be encountering, you know, some friction that you might not have had, have had before, and to really take pains to, uh, to be forgiving, <laughs> to, to allow some of these critical comments to pass. Uh, I mean, any time there's an external stressor, uh, people will start to um, become maybe a bit more sharp in their comments or a bit more critical. And, um, you know, you try to keep channels of communication open, maybe find some relatively low pressure uh, things to do that, together, like watch a movie. I mean, one thing is that it takes the guilty out of guilty pleasure, pleasure right now. It's, um, you know, a real, serves a real function to be able to just relax and, and, and enjoy time with each other in a, in a low pressure kind of situation, a low, kind, low pressure kind of activity. Mm -hmm. So we're actually getting some questions coming in and I, I was going to just go to question time, but I might inter, um, in, interweave the questions coming in from the audience because there's some that are quite relevant to what we're talking about now. So um, basically we're, we're getting a couple of questions which are saying, how do we relieve the tendency or the pressure or the guilt there's all different words being used in this chat, that we think, in fact, mothers may be taking on a little more than fathers in these environments. Um, and it, so there's a gender perspective here on how much of the ch children's stress, how much of the partner's stress somebody takes on and tries to ameliorate. How do we balance that out and make sure that everyone's taking a bit of the emotional load? That's a biggie, and I think this has, this is, these circumstances have distilled down a problem that's much more broad in terms of the division of domestic labour. Um, so we could do a whole other webinar on that, I think, and have much more sort of uh, qualified people speaking to that. Um, but I think it is really important to acknowledge that, um, and, and what the research that's coming out of this sort of those rapid research reviews and surveys is that women are taking on more of the load um, without necessarily any reduction in their responsibilities around work occupational stuff. Um, and so that's not just the domestic stuff, but it's also the mental load, planning um, for things, organising things. It's the homeschooling it, or the home learning um, as well as all of their occupational stuff. Um, and I think that the first step is it's really important to acknowledge that um, and acknowledge it within your the micro, microcosm of your family as well. Um, and I'm all about family meetings. Um, and I always, with the families that I work with, when 
we introduce something new, um, say I'm introducing with a family um, a new house rule for the, for the parents to um, implement with the kids, have a family meeting, sit down and talk about what is driving the introduction of this new thing, what the expectations are around behaviour, um, and what it will look like if those expectations aren't met or are met. Um, and I think with the division of labour in the household, that's sort of, that, I think that's an appropriate time to have a family meeting about that and have some structure around that. Um, and I think the way that you deliver that, um, both parties, both partnerships, um, uh, both parties of the partnership, I always like, it's just like a little tidbit, but I always like from the assertive communication space, the idea of I statements, um, because I think when we're really stressed and we're annoyed and we're having all of these feelings, we tend to go into accusation mode and blame mode, and that might be warranted, but I don't know how helpful it is in terms of um, then driving behaviour change in, in your partner. So then coming at it with an I statement, which is more centering your feeling, the effect of the behaviour on your feelings, and then how you need the behaviour to be different can be sort of a very conscious, deliberate change in how you express it. So it's, I'm feeling really uh, overwhelmed when I'm left with cleaning, making dinner, cleaning up after dinner and getting the kids into shower. I'm wondering if you can X, Y, and Z. So it's the centering of how the behaviour, how, the, how the, the situation is making me feel. What we know is that that can soften the reaction, that we get less defensiveness from that. But that's a practical thing that um, mums in particular or, um, yeah, the primary caregivers in the household can think about in terms of having those conversations because I do think the conversations need to be had. And what about that sharing the chores? So, um, you know, I come to this conversation qualified only by knowing you. Uh, and uh, and being a parent myself, one of the things opportunities I took during lockdown was to say, well, we've got more time at home. Everyone's here. Let's have a meeting and let's all pick our favourite chore, and that will be our new responsibility. Um, and I thought, well, you know, if nothing else, they'll learn how to do the washing and you know how to cook. And they now cook once a week. That kind of thing. It's the slightly older children, but it was an opportunity, and it also took the load off me. So that was a like. And then I started thinking, gosh, am I adding to the anxiety of my children by loading them up with another thing, another responsibility? So do you, either of you have much information about, you know, what does the research say about children having chores or responsibilities and sticking to those types of activities? I think there are two things here. So the first is that having expectations of kids around contributing um, it can be an incredibly useful way of enhancing their self-efficacy, mm. so, which is the idea of a, a belief in yourself to be able, to be competent, to have mastery experiences. And what we know from the research is that when kids feel self-efficacy, when they, they, they believe themselves to be efficacious, then um, the outcomes are a lot better. So I'm all about giving chores to kids for that reason. But the second thing that I think is more coronavirus specific is that the world became a very uncertain, um, unpredictable place for a while there. Not going to school anymore, mum's home, um, don't get to see grandparents. And so what the expectation can, of kids doing things regularly, doing things in a room as part of a routine. So your job is to do the washing up after dinner and you expected to do that on, on four weekdays that contributes to a sense of structure and routine in a world that might have felt very unfamiliar and very unsafe and unpredictable. And what we know about structure and routine is that kids thrive under those conditions when they believe their environment, their world to be a safe, predictable place. So professional advice, I think, give the, give the kids the chores. I'm all for it. Really? Me? Yeah. Oh, all my guilt is gone. <laughs> Thank you for everybody. <laughs> What about that, that question um, about grandparents as well? So we're, we're, we're all stuck in our homes, but we're stuck in really kind of small family units and that usual connection that we might have with friends and, and family and in-laws and grandparents that might kind of relieve the tension, give us a bit of a break. That has been really difficult. How, how do people stay connected? We're really fortunate to be that this is happening in a time when we have the technology that we do. 
And this is something that, for example, my family has been trying to navigate for the past, since we, since we moved uh, to Australia. Uh, half my kids' grandparents live in America, their aunt and uncle live in America, their cousins live in America. And so, uh, I mean, things like video conferencing, Skype and Zoom have really been a blessing uh, just to have, to hang out together. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, communicating with uh, my parents or uh, my kids' grandparents, my kids were able to put on some shows for them over the, uh, over the, um, over the internet. Uh, the, the fact that we have live streaming means that um, you know, I can actually show them their, share activities with um, their grandparents in real time. Um, you know, and then sometimes uh, older relatives, for example, don't necessarily have uh, a whole lot of advanced technology that they're working with or don't know how to use it yet. Uh, but a lot of this you can do over the phone as well. Um, just taking the opportunity to share little daily moments, I'd say, is, is an important thing. Don't just save the communication for the big events or the, or, or, or the big milestones. But, you know, when, when you are together in person, it's those little, little moments that uh, make a big difference, that, that bring that closeness. And I think that we're able to, the more we're able to share those, um, the, the better it'll be as well. And good for the grandparents as well, isn't it? So what, what are the key issues? So if, with grandparents, my understanding is isolation is one of the key mental health issues for older people. Yes, yeah, definitely. So particularly for the elderly, social isolation um, we know contributes to physical and mental health, for escalations in physical and mental health problems. So um, blood pressure, it, immune system stuff, but mental health-wise, anxiety, depression, um, Alzheimer's. Um, so for this group in particular, social isolation is going to hit pretty hard, particularly because, yes, we're not seeing family um, uh, and, and friends, but also things like going to the grocery shop and um, or if an elderly person's living in a nursing home, having um, someone come in and give meals or, but those things have been shut down as well. So it's sort of compounded, every, no, there's no access. So I think it is really important from a grandparent's point of view that we do try our best to maintain through all of the beautiful sort of suggestions that Steve that Steve sort of mentioned then and plus other ones um, that we do maintain those links because we want to take care of our grandparents um, and make sure that they kind of come out of this not any of the worse than, um, yeah, if we can help that. Mm, and that's really interesting to hear about that frequency of, you know, keeping that contact going, even if it's small, to be like playing the piano a little bit every day, um, <laughs> isn't that the whole lot in one day a week. So what about the tensions that build? So we, we've got some questions coming in the chat outline, and I was thinking myself around, do, pair, do, do children with behavioural problems, or just children in general, tend to explode more? Do they resist more, um, you know, it, under these kind of difficult circumstances? Yeah, I think the interesting thing with kids is that um, their feelings emerge in a much more undifferentiated way compared to adults. So if an adult's feeling anxious, their behaviour is going to look very different to someone who's experiencing some sort of other um, sort of um, mental psychopathology. Um, whereas kids, you sort of just get behaviour. They're less able to express what they feel. Um, you're more likely, depending on whether they're feeling anxious or um, whether they're acting out and being oppositional, it's all going to look sort of like tantrumy and um, boundary pushing um, and teary. It can look all the same. So I think that's a really important thing to remember with managing behaviour, that yes, more kids under these circumstances, your typical kids who usually do an all right, are going to be showing more of those things, but it might look quite different. Uh, but yes, definitely the kids who are coming in with pre-existing um, emotional behavioural difficulties, the dial's going to be really turned up those kids and I've spent a lot of time thinking about those families they're the families that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis and I remember speaking to, to a couple of parents who when the schools went into lockdown and they're like they're going to be there all the time and I think it's important to acknowledge that schools respite for parents from kids who have high needs in terms of behavior or, or um, sort of developmental needs um, and what we know about parent-child interactions is that when parents are feeling more stressed, when they have fewer emotional resources, when they're less patient, less tolerant, they're more likely to react to kid behaviours that may not be any different to usual. And then we can get stuck in this cycle with 
kids reacting to parents' reactions and that's when it's sort of everything goes awry. And I sort of want to spend this time acknowledging that this is particularly problematic for families where, and what we know is that coronavirus has affected um, families where family violence is a thing. Um, and so the risk for that vulnerable population where there's domestic violence or child maltreatment, again, the dial's been turned up on that. And it's an incredibly important goal for us is as service providers to meet the the heightened needs of, of those particular vulnerable populations. And so that goes back to what we were talking about before about the techniques of regulating emotions and, and naming them and, and and also giving yourself a break and being forgiving. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, that comes full circle. Yes, Stephen. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just nodding along. And... <laughs> okay, great. So there are some um, resources now being posted in the chat session as well. So a lot of the questions that are coming up around some of these issues are, um, are answered in those resources and you can look at them after we finish the conversation. But we are getting questions coming up around the, the um, finances as well. So part of what's building in this stressful period is people's uncertainty about income and indeed many people who have actually lost their jobs. So I'll just read this one out, but given the economic impact of COVID-19 in society, how do we prepare children for changes in their routines due to parents losing part or all of their regular income? So how do you tell your kids that you can't afford to pay for certain activities or they might have to stop certain, you know, they may even have to change schools. You know, how do we deal with this kind of externally driven internal impact? I think the big thing is it, it is important to be honest with the caveat that kids they don't necessarily need all of the nitty-gritty of the information. Um, but I think, uh, depending on the age of the kid as well, the transparency in, in what's sort of happening in the family um, can be really important because if kids don't, we, what we know is that if kids don't have the facts and don't have the information, their imagination steps in. Um, and what they imagine is, is often much worse than what the reality is. So give the kids the information they need to sort of be able to understand what's going on with the caveat that they don't necessarily need to know it all, perhaps. Um, and I think in terms of how to, how to talk about it with them, again, there's always developmental concerns. Um, with the younger kids, I find that um, teaching them using play or stories or writing little social stories with them can really help explain sort of what they need to be doing in, sort of, in terms of their behaviour um, and it can make it again external and concrete to them. With the older kids, with the adolescents, having sort of a frank conversation and and emphasising what they can do to regain a bit of control around their environment because that's, that's a lot of where anxiety comes from, is this uncertainty, this unknown. Um, I'm worried about you, my parent, I'm worried about what this means for me, so validating the feelings around the loss, I can't do that sport, I have to leave school yet. All those things really suck and I get that they suck. Um, and so validating that, um, but yeah, and, and, and but having that honest conversation and, and, and letting them know what they can still do, what they can still control in their environment will again move them hopefully more towards feeling self-efficacy, feeling things that are to some extent under their control, um, I think. So an example of that would be, yeah, there are more of these changes happening what can you do to sort of maintain your soccer skills if that isn't? Can we organise to be able to go down to the oval and have a kick around? You still have control over these things. And that's not, I know that's such a small thing and economic, the economic stuff is, is so much bigger than what we have space to, to acknowledge and the hardship of that in this sort of forum. Um, and if you, if anyone's parent or child's emotions, if you notice that it's not regulating and it's not resolving as things get better, as the unemployment goes on, depression can happen, seek out professional advice, get a sounding board, get someone who's in your corner, who's in your kid's corner, who you can sort of speak through some of these things with. Anything to add there, Stephen? I, I mean, I have found that um, even with my uh, younger, younger daughter, um, who's just started school, uh, you know, we, we found that we're, when we need to talk to her about things, we're very able to have a conversation about the whys 
you know, the why is this happening? Why is this situation changing? And it really helps with um, her understanding as well, and perhaps her efficacy, as as Georgie was uh, saying, is um, you know not just that. You know, I think that understanding the what is causing this change in circumstances, and maybe talking together about how we might navigate this change together, um, can lend a sense of control. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, look, and I think we often underestimate how much the kid, how frank kids are with each other. So they will often be having conversations about their own family situation at school and sharing quite a lot and understanding the world via that, that knowledge. And so they may actually know a lot more than we think. So being transparent and frank can, can help them gain trust in you. And, and if you, I think it comes back to that chores thing as well. If they can be helping a family that's going into financial stress, that's going to give them a sense of empowerment and efficacy, as you call it, um, which, which should be actually very soulful and helpful. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition to the schooling because that's been just such a hot topic for people is how, how do parents teach their kids at home uh, or how do they help their kids learn by this online approach, um, how much information is too much information and, you know, how, how can we help through that situation? Now, many children have gone back to school in New South Wales, but we can see the circumstances where many suburbs have just been announced back in lockdown in Melbourne. So it is possible with the continuing cases of the virus that we get a spike again in New South Wales and that we get, you know, taken back from school again. I guess the big question that, that hits many of us is, you know, would it hurt if kids lost six months of formal education? You know, how, how important it is, is it that everybody does do those seven or eight hours of school in a day? I think, <laughs> so what we know from past disasters, so something like the 2011 Christchurch earthquake in, in New Zealand, um, is that most, recover, most kids recover well academically. So most kids are going to do all right. But there are some kids who are more vulnerable um, to learning losses and the emotional, social effects of, of something like a lockdown and home learning. Um, and those the, the vulnerable populations are the kids that we need to identify and provide support services for. So those types of kids are those who um, are sort of experiencing persistent disadvantage that's a product of the system. So um, members of First Nation individuals, members of Indigenous communities, refugees, people living in poverty, those who are based in rural and remote locations, not all individuals who are a part of those sort of groups, but on average, um, they're, they're the types of kids who may experience learning losses for whom six months of missing out on learning is actually going to have an impact, as well as those kids who are already um, educationally disengaged. Um, we we risk that they're going to that's going to be perpetuated, um, and also the, the little ones, the early learners, they're particularly vulnerable as well um, because they're learning some very fundamental skills. And when the, when we miss out on, on learning those, then um, it can really affect um, detrimentally outcomes later on. So I think majority of kids are going to be okay, but there are subgroups who are going to suffer learning losses and they're the kids we need to identify and remediate. Mm, absolutely. And what about this kind of, if, if children are struggling with attending large Zoom classes, which, you know, classes are difficult at the best of times with 30 kids and one teacher, but when it's online, that can be a really difficult opportunity for, for I guess, people to daydream and to, to lose yeah. engagement. How do we help children concentrate, I guess, or perhaps is there a self-guided approach to education that might help? I, I think that it's easy to underestimate just how many educational opportunities there are at home. Uh, there are certain things that formal education through, the, through schools does well, but there are actually some things that, uh, you know, that it doesn't do quite as well. So, for example, as children get taught you know, to, to follow a certain curriculum, in some cases, uh, there's a lost opportunity to, for them to uh, follow their own curiosity and to uh, you know, learn through their own creativity. Uh, some things that kids really need to learn are things like um, 
and how to uh, collaborate with others and how to communicate and how to, you know, to learn how to learn in a way. And there's so many opportunities around the home to do that. Or even if you were to take your kid uh, on a trip to the supermarket, you can have conversations. I remember hearing uh, an interview with a, a great developmental psychologist, uh, Roberta uh, Golenkoff, and talked about how just going to um, the uh, grocery store, you can, you know, let's say you come across an eggplant, you can start talking about how, look, this is the only purple vegetable. Did you know that? How do you think it tastes? Well, that's what happens if you go home and we uh, cook it and, and see if we can find a recipe together. And, and then you're incorporating some, you know, some creativity in there and some discussion. Uh, they're building on, their, on on your enthusiasm. And uh, there's even, you know, in terms of what formal schooling actually looks like, there are schools that have tried to uh, mimic the kinds of opportunities that kids get at home. There's the Sudbury Valley School in Massachusetts in the U.S., where the entire curriculum is focused on following kids' own curiosity. They, they try to note what the kids are interested in and try to build lessons around that to sort of scaffold uh, what they're going to learn. Um, and so there are some really, you might argue, some really rich opportunities to, to you know, scaffold kids' learning at home that are, are in some cases even, even, more, even better than, than what they might get at school. So just because kids are missing out on, on, on school, you know, in the actual school, uh, in the formal education, it, it doesn't mean that there's a completely lost opportunity for them to continue to learn in important ways. Mm -hmm. So that also brings us to the issue of, well, you're talking about great ways of getting them to learn away from a screen. Now, um, we are getting some questions in around screen time, which is a hot topic. You know, in, in the past, most of the, of the guidance for parents has been to really limit screen time, probably quite substantially. Now we're being asked to put our children in front of the screen for the first time of the day. Where's the... You know, where's the evidence about whether or not that's good for the kid or is it damaging? Like, are, are we permanently, you know, giving all of our children square eyes? What's what's happening there? Oh, screen time. It's such a broad topic because, you know, the, the, the reality is we live in a screen-based world now and um, I don't know how realistic it is to talk about um, limiting kids' access sort of completely. Um, there are guidelines, there are recommendations, so we know that screen time isn't recommended for under two-year-olds. Um, in the past, they spoke about less than one to two hours um, of screen time for entertainment purposes. But when you're home learning, when you're at home all the time and you can't go out and do your, your sports or go to flip out or you, you visit grandparents, it's inevitable that the screen time is going to increase. So I think, first of all, have a bit of compassion for yourself as parents that it, it is just it, the nature of it is that screen time is going to go up and, and and that's okay I don't know um, I think there's I'll be interested to see in, in several years time what the, the the research tells us is the sort of neurological impacts of, of increased on average screen time for everybody I don't know if we can speak to that yet or at least I'm definitely not an expert in that so practically in terms of screen time first acknowledge that it's going to Second, try and set some boundaries around it. I think in terms of home learning, if that's how they're learning and that's how they're expected to access their educational resources, then I don't think there's much that we can do about that in our under and home learning environment. Uh, bearing in mind doing all of the things that Steve said around how can we make learning happen sort of in other spaces using other mediums. Um, and then in for entertainment screen time purposes, how can you make change it up? How can you encourage the the, the physical activity? Um, I know that so my parents-in-law um, they've really got into online Zumba recently. So um, they actually are using their screen times to promote their physical activity, which I think you can do with kids. There's a lot of um, resources and uh, out there for that. Um, and the biggest thing as well for parents is to monitor what your kids are consuming um, on their screens. Um, we know that monitoring supervision is a really important um, predictor of kids going on to sort of have behaviour problems in the future. So we want to make sure that what they're consuming online um, or on their apps, it's kids' YouTube, but, you know, things can sneak through. So keep on top of that. Um, would be a couple of sort of more practical things around screen time. But the biggest thing, self-compassion. We're not in normal circumstances here. Totally agree. But, but, but I, I mean, just this, the concept of, of, of 
screen time just involves these days just so much. I mean, there's so many different really creative uh, and educational activities that you can engage in on the screen. Just um, last night, uh, my daughter and I were using uh, Google Earth to actually zoom in on streets in Paris. And she's, because she's been talking about Paris for the last couple of weeks. She, she, wants to, she said that when she's older, she wants to move there. And so we went and we uh, actually walked around neighborhoods using Google Earth about Paris. And then we got a little tired of that. We zoomed across the ocean to Fiji to see how that, you know, how it looks different there in the world. So there's all these different ways of interacting with the screen that aren't limited to just, um, you know, sitting down and, and, and getting square eyes, like you said. Uh, although, though I completely agree with what Georgie said, is that we have to have compassion on ourselves as well. Uh, the, the screen time is going to go up. Um, there are websites like Common Sense Media that uh, people, that parents can look up to sort of try to get a sense of how, whether a certain movie or a show is, has educational value or is appropriate for certain ages, and that can be a valuable resource as well. Yeah. My understanding is that the more we get to understand the brain, uh, and especially using big data and, and neuroscience and artificial intelligence, the better these computers get at, um, at educating. And so they're talking now about having personal computers that would actually be the teacher in the home of the child. Now we're getting into the sci-fi futuristic part of, part of our discussion. What do you know about that? Can, can we actually have a better experience than we currently do with screens and with computers, with artificial intelligence shortly into the future, or is that a long way off? I, I don't think it's that far off, or at least attempts to, to, to build these capacities into the personal computers aren't that far off. There's actually a field of research right now that's called affective uh, computer science or affective computing. Uh, and that's trying to build on insight from psychology and from neuroscience about how emotion works and how we can read the, um, the emotions of others uh, based on their responses and some, sometimes based on their facial expressions. And so there's a real push. It's actually uh, companies that are really developing software and programs that, are, that they um, Report that they're, they're, they're trying to uh, engage and, and, and register the emotions of the users and respond to that, not just whether they're getting the answers correctly, correct or not, uh, but to sort of register their emotional reactions and adapt that way. Um, now, I have to say that the success of these programs in doing that is not quite there yet. There's reason to think that uh, reading the emotions of others is a uniquely human ability that that computers can't yet, you know, mimic. But uh, there's certainly um, companies that are putting a lot of money into trying to develop that capacity. And given the amount of research that's going into it, I, I don't imagine it, that things like this are too far off. Mm. And certainly we know that, uh, you know, some of our social media products are actually already trying to use our emotions to get more engagements. And this can be positive and negative, as we've mentioned. So often they'll be trying to elicit a dislike or a hate and putting material in front of you deliberately to make you angry or annoyed because you're actually more emotionally engaged with, with the product, which is, I think, very, very odd. But Georgie, do you have some new kind of new approaches to parenting that you can see being implemented soon? Okay. Yeah, so I think what the I have sort of just two ideas on this question. So one is that I think what Corona has done is really brought about more conversations about emotions. And I think as families, we're probably speaking about emotion much more than we have in the past, which I think is only a good thing because where do kids learn about emotions? It's sort of just through being the world osmosis. There's not sort of this very um deliberate uh, and and conscious effort to upskill kids in their emotional skills. So um, I think that's sort of, I, I quite like that. That's the, that's the silver lining of this whole shebang of a, of a pandemic. But the other thing that sort of is closer to my my heart is that what the this situation has done is really put at the forefront that we need as, as clinical psychologists and other sort of service providers, we need to we need to adapt, we need to go online. And so what we did in the clinic where I'm currently working um, out at Ingleburn Public School, we're doing a project out there servicing a few areas in the, a few schools in the area, is we started doing therapy online. And we do a type of therapy that has the parent and the child come in and the 
parents wearing sort of a wireless earpiece and the therapist coaches the parent in how to use evidence-based parenting skills while they're there with their child, getting immediate feedback, experimenting, trying things out. So when we went into lockdown, we couldn't do that anymore. Parents couldn't come. So we took it online and we set up exactly the same sort of thing as what we're doing now. Um, and parents wore their little sort of like their AirPods or their wireless, you know, earphones. And we coached parents how to use parenting skills in their own home, which, you know, we were starting to think about that a bit before, but we made it necessary to get good at that now and to disseminate that out to sort of community practitioners. So that's sort of a bit of a, um, you know, a passion project of mine to get the accessibility of support services um, so to, to kickstart that by putting them online and, and providing members of the community who, who wouldn't necessarily be able to access their specialist services with access. So I think they're sort of two exciting directions from my perspective um, in terms of the recovery, our, our moving our steps forward, what does the future look like in a post-pandemic world? Mm, and the COVID crisis has certainly pushed many of us into the 21st century, removed some of the inertia that we had. Certainly the universities have rapidly taken all of our education activities online and there's been some real creativity in the way we've done it, including I've, I've heard wonderful stories of people, um, teachers sending experimental packs to all of their students and then running the, the experiment online. I'm not sure the insurance is exactly going to come on us, but... <laughs> I hope, I hope we're all okay. I'm sure we got ethics, we're good to go with ethics. But a big shout out to teachers, both in tertiary, but also in primary, secondary spaces, like the heroes of this whole thing, along with the parents. They're on the front line, along with our health workers. So a big shout out to parents, uh, to, to teachers there for all of their efforts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they've been incredibly creative. And and tolerant and hardworking, you know, as always, but just to be able to keep our children learning, even if not as, the, as rapidly as they might have face-to-face, -face, has been an outstanding effort. And to all the parents who have joined us this, uh, today, you know, we're, we're coming to the conclusion of what's been a really interesting discussion. Congratulations to you as well. It's been such an extra effort um, and it may continue. We've had some fantastic questions down the side and, and one of the ones I just want to touch on now is, you know, what happens if COVID goes on for longer than we first thought? And, and, and reality is sinking in for most people that COVID and the COVID impacts, economic impacts of COVID, will last much longer than people originally predicted. So one of the things we're all going to need in this parenting gig is endurance. So can I get just some final comments from Georgie and Steve before I close up? I mean, I personally would like to have a little earpiece, one with Steve and one with Georgie, and most of the time I'm parenting so that I can get this solid advice. But I realise that's a bit too much to ask, even from the dean. So just in these last few minutes, give us a bit of guidance. How do we keep our energy up? How do we keep going, try and say stay sane and try and stay there for our children during this long endurance run. All right, if I had to pick a closing remark to end on, it would be remember the love and that's wishy-washy, but it's all about the relationship. All of this stuff comes down to relationship and what can you do as a parent to maintain the relationship that you have with your kids um, particularly, you know, those living kids um, where uh, emotions will become strange just inevitably because of all the stresses that are happening now externally, but also internally to the families, um, internally to the family in terms of job losses and economic strain and, um, you know, uh, bereavement associated with the, the illness. So what are you doing deliberately, mindfully to maintain your relationships with your kids? Um, is my take-home message. And there are a whole bunch of things you can be doing depending on how old they are. With your little ones, I always recommend five minutes a day of one-on-one -on -one child led play. Play with them, bring the fun, bring the love. So I think in terms of endurance, if your relationship with the people around you remains strong, then you're going to be at your best to endure this 
hopefully as few sort of negative consequences to your family to your relationships as possible. Beautiful advice, and Steve. It, it doesn't get more any more important than what Georgie just said. I, I think that um, you know this is really in a really intense time uh, for all of us, and one of the most important things is to um, reach out to others if if you feel that you're lacking a social connection to um, you know try to keep uh, channels of communication open you know both be with people inside your home and as well as people outside your home. Um, don't feel shy about telling people how you're feeling uh, and about expressing what you need. Uh, and also, um, you know, be forgiving of yourself. I think a lot of our expectations of ourselves have still carried, have, uh, that we have of ourselves now, are really informed by the way things were before. And I think we need to really learn to pace ourselves a little bit differently, make sure that we are taking care of ourselves, whether that means making sure we get sleep, uh, exercise, some downtime. Uh, and better that we're able to take care of ourselves and make sure that you know our own emotional and social needs are met, the better position will be to make sure that the, those needs are also met in our kids and in, in our partners. Um, so that's a beautiful place to end. We've got kindness, compassion, love, mm -hmm. all incredibly important, um, and patience, I think, is, is one of the key things that we need to remember here. Thank you to everyone who's been watching um, and posting questions. Thank you for your patience if I didn't get to your question, but I think I got to most of them. Um, reminder that there is a, a set of resources that have been posted in the chat section that's been posted twice, um, and they uh, the university will also post a survey for feedback on this. As it's our first digital sci-fi series event, uh, we'd love to hear what worked and, and what could be improved, uh, and we will bring you more of the sci-fi series as the year goes on. On behalf of UNSW Science, I'd like to thank our panellists, Steve Rose, for his returning. Um, you've been absolutely superb. And thank you again also for providing those resources. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. I hope it was interesting and entertaining. Just a reminder that this has been recorded and it will be posted publicly. So if you would like to share this recording for any of your friends and family who are going through pandemic parenting, and interested in building resilience of not only the children, but of the parents and the grandparents and the friends and the family, then that will be available for you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much.